Let's pick up from where we left off last time. Heaven is not the wide blue sky, but the place where the body is made in the house of the Creator. What does that mean? <laughs> well, again, it's a reference to Paticca Samupada. Here's a diagram of Paticca Samupada. You should do your own research on this. I've presented it in, I don't know, half a dozen different videos. Um, you can go back and find them, especially The Art of Becoming is a series that's just about this subject. So anyway, so that I don't waste a lot of time giving information I've already given. The process of Paticca Samupada is how the being creates an embodiment. So when the body is finished, the being leaves it and immediately begins to create a new body. Actually, anyone who's a little bit intelligent and spiritually aware will begin to create the next body before the end of this body. That way you get a lot more control over who you're going to become in the next life. That's what bhakti is all about. That's actually what Tantra is all about. And deep in the Buddha's teaching, uh, to a degree or a level where a few people ever reach, there is this teaching of Paticca Samupada. And Paticca Samupada is a great, uh, sometimes also known as Madhyamaka, or the middle way. Say, so how is that? I thought the middle way was sort of like a compromise. <laughs> that people use to justify being loose about following the rules and regulations. Well, you can look at it that way, I suppose. But what the middle way really is, is revealed by the Buddha. One time he was talking with a logician, a Brahmin, and he said, Buddha said, this is, is an extreme position. This is not, is the opposite extreme. The Tathagata leaves both extremes alone and takes the path in the middle. And then he goes on to explain Paticca Samupada. So if you go back to the actual suttas, the teaching of the middle way is totally Paticca Samupada, dependent origination. That is the middle way. And the middle way means don't either praise or blame what is, because you created it. How? By creating this body. And this body, from its beginning, is attuned to a specific range of experience. And what we're going to go into <laughs> is in, in this episode, I'm chuckling because it's going to blow your mind if you actually follow it. <laughs> What we're going into in this episode is a deep discussion on the logic behind Paticca Samupada. Now, the, the Buddha, he's not a logician, so he doesn't talk about logic. But there are several different systems of logic, and depending on which one you subscribe to, that will determine the range of your cognitions. So, for example, in the West, we have two-valued logic, called Aristotelian logic, because it was developed by Aristotle. Two-valued logic is binary logic, digital logic. It's either right or wrong, true or false. It either is or is not. And of course, this has given rise to modern science, also modern religion, and many other fields. But this type of reasoning is extremely limited. Try to understand 
this world is not a black and white world. Huh? It's all shades of gray, indeterminate. Huh? And in the ancient Vedas, there was a three-valued logic system, true, false, and indeterminate, in the middle somewhere, in the shades of gray. So it has to be recognized that you cannot simply assign one truth value, true or false. You have to measure where things fall on the scale of gray between white and black. Huh? It's not enough to divide the whole universe into yin and yang. And they admit this by the fact that within the yin-yang symbol, uh, the yin has a small yang circle and the yang has a small yin circle in the middle. So these are exceptions. Any logic system based on absolute right and wrong is going to have many exceptions. So many exceptions that the exception becomes the rule. <laughs> so ancient Vedas had a three-valued logic system, but in the modern days, it has become just the same as the West. And for example, all of the uh, uh, monist and dualist thinkers used the black and white, right and wrong, two-valued logic si system. There was only one uh, in the Gaudiya Vaishnava system, which is called uh, Achinta Beda Bheda Tattva, which means the inconceivable, neither uh, one nor dual, neither monist nor dualism, huh? neither, but it's inconceivable. <laughs> well, where did this idea of inconceivability come from? It sure didn't come from Buddha. Buddha used a four-valued logic system. Either something is true, or it's false, or it's both true and false, or it's neither true nor false. And this is called the quadrilemma, or the tetralemma, meaning a four-valued logic system. But even beyond that is the logic system introduced uh, by the Jains. Mahavira created this logic system with seven values, and they are, in some ways it is, in some ways it is not. In some ways it is and it is not. In some ways it is and it is inconceivable. In some ways it is not and it is inconceivable. In some ways it is, it is not, and it is inconceivable. And finally, in some ways it's just inconceivable. <laughs> Jain logic, uh, Mahavir's logic is called Anekantavada. Now, what does this mean? Ekanta means there's only one way. And this is the old or uh, obsolete or crippled truth system that most people are trying to operate with. Anekanta means there's not just one way. And Vada, of course, is a philosophical or logical system. So Anekantavada means a system of logic or truth that shows respect and understanding for a multiplicity of views. Anekanta, not just one way. See? Because if we look at things just one way, it's always wrong. <laughs> or at least it's incomplete. We're only looking at one side. We're only looking from one point of view. Let me explain this. Now, those who have followed us for a long time will remember this. The consciousness triple. An ontology device used to describe the uh, atomic structure of consciousness. What we have in consciousness is a subject, an object, and a relation. If there's no relation between the subject and object, you can't have consciousness. If there's no object, you can't have consciousness either, because what is there to be conscious of? Similarly, without a subject, of course, there's no consciousness. So, if the tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it, 
It really didn't happen. <laughs> That's consciousness. Now, a step beyond consciousness is awareness. Awareness means you have a subject, you have an object, and you have the absolute truth. Now, what is the absolute truth? The sum total of all objects, subjects, and points of view or relations. So the subject is actually the context for the existence of the object. Well, why is that? Because the context determines meaning. And when we become aware of some object, when we become conscious of an object, we give it some meaning, don't we? We say, I like it, I don't like it, or I don't care. So basically, consciousness depends on a three-valued system of logic. Because if we had to classify everything that we don't care about, it would be so much more work for our poor, tired minds, <laughs> our overworked brain cells. So what we do is we simply dump it. We don't care. It goes in the trash. And it would probably be 80 to 90 percent of what we experience that goes in the trash. Which means that if we are unaware of the meaning of something, of the value of an experience, then we might as well not even have had that experience because we're not going to see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, or even remember it. It's just going to go away. So this is what I mean when I say everybody has spiritual experiences, but most of us don't even perceive them because they don't fall into our ontology. We have no name and form to describe them, no classification to name them. So they simply get thrown in the trash with all the other stuff that doesn't matter. Except it does matter. Because your level of spiritual experience is going to determine the type of body that you can create in the next life. So let's go on and explain this further. We're now we're using this system that uh, appreciates and respects multiple points of view, okay? So that which falls within our context is meaningful and real to us. But that which falls outside of our context is meaningless to us, valueless to us, and also inconceivable. What is this word inconceivable? It comes from abhyakta. Remember back in the truth tables, seven truth values, each one uh, toward the end is, is uh, suffixed by avaktavyaha. Avaktavyaha means something that cannot be spoken, the unspeakable, or the unutterable, which is the same as saying the inconceivable. Because after all, if we don't have language for something, we can't conceive of it. So therefore, that which is beyond our limited horizon is inconceivable to us. If we have never had this kind of experience before, we can't imagine it, we certainly can't think about it. So, we don't have names for the things that we don't uh, talk about or can't talk about. They go in the trash can with everything. But these are some of the most valuable things in existence. Let's take another look at the same thing from a different perspective. This is a Venn diagram showing the absolute truth, which is all views, objects, and subjects. And then we have the subject, which is ourself. The subject, which provides the context that gives meaning to the objects is within the realm of the conceivable universe for us. But everything outside of that remains inconceivable, unexperienced, and unexperienceable for us, even if it happens right in front of our nose. So this is the problem. And this is why the Jain logic says things can be, but not be conceivable. Something can be or it cannot be, 
or it could be and not be, or it can neither be nor not be, and still be inconceivable. Therefore, whatever point of view we take, there are so many more points of view that are equally valid that we don't take and we're not aware of. For example, in this figure, this is the same thing again from a different viewpoint or a different view. The absolute truth is the whole, the yellow or gold colored ellipse. And then the subjective views, the context that we create with our name and form, are within the view of our self, our subject, and those objects or the content that exists in that context have meaning and reality for us. It's conceivable. However, the other things that are, so to speak, behind us that we can't see are inconceivable for us, even if they're real. So this means the entire realm of the inconceivable is much, much greater, actually, than the conceivable. So, therefore, Jane logic includes the values of being, but inconceivable, or and inconceivable, or not being, and inconceivable. So how does this all fit into our explanation so far? Okay. In the square inch, in the square foot, is the heaven. It is the seat of the creative. It is where the body is built and created. The body that we have now was something that we created by the process of Paticca Samupada. And again, you should go back and look at those videos. I'm going to put a link up on the screen here so you can find them. But this process is something that we do. It's not something that happens to us by some impersonal laws of nature. Although we may rationalize it like that because we don't want to take responsibility for the mess that we've created. So, we fool ourselves into thinking, oh, it's my karma. Oh, God, God did it to me. Nature did it to me. Huh? Nature's laws. The terrible impersonal universe. <laughs> no. <laughs> you didn't get it. You don't remember. After death, when ha one has no body and is craving experience at birth, one creates a body through the process of Paticca Samuppada. You can remember or you cannot remember. It doesn't make any difference. That's how it happens. So, what we're doing here and this is, the, remember, this is the aim of Tantra, this is the aim of Yoga, this is the aim of Bhakti, of all bona fide uh, forms of self-realization. What we're doing is creating the next body in this life. So this process, this golden flower process, what it does is it creates a new body, or the seed of a new body, the name and form. Uh, it fabricates a name and form of a new body while still in the present body. Then, in the future, when this body is no longer viable, it has to be thrown out, let go, dropped off, whatever you want to call it, uh, at the time of death. Then we simply go on and create that body to its fruition, to its birth. It's very, very simple. It's simple for the simple, as one of my gurus used to say. Of course, if you're a complicated person, you make a big mess out of it, but that's not my problem. That's yours. So anyway, this process allows a person to sculpt, to shape, to form, a body on a new level of beingness, built from light, built from pure awareness, pure consciousness, pure energy. This is the actual secret of the golden flower. 